So good evening, everybody, and thanks for joining us. Welcome to the latest session in our Jazz Connector professional development series. This month, we're focusing on digital distribution, giving you all the info you'll need to release music digitally in 2021. We're delighted to be joined tonight by Henrietta Heimdall. Uh, Henrietta is the Marketing Development Coordinator for Europe and the UK at CD Baby, the largest global digital distributor of independent music. Her role includes building and maintaining relationships with local CD Baby artists and commercial partners, coordinating the production of industry events for the company, and assisting with the development of CD Baby's international business. CD Baby can have an important role in your music distribution. So without further ado, I'm going to hand things over to Hen so we can get started. Take it away, Hen. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's very nice to meet you. I see some faces. Let me just go and share my presentation. Can you guys all see that? OK. Yeah, brilliant. Yes. Perfect. So uh, my name is Hen. Um, uh, as Adam mentioned, I work for a company called CD Baby, which is an independent distributor focusing primarily on DIY musicians and smaller labels. Um, we've been around for over 20 years, hence the, hence the name. <laughs> but uh, uh, sorry, we were, uh, we were set up in America roughly 20 years ago, but uh, we haven't really had a European presence until about three years ago when we established our first European office to try to um, kind of build stronger connection with, with artists on the ground here and be able to respond to their needs and be able to kind of tailor our service accordingly. Um, so before, before I was working at CD Baby, I was at this organization called WIN, which is the Worldwide Independent Network. Um, it's a global trade organization for independent record labels. So I know that you guys have recently been fortunate enough to get AIM Ireland, um, which is a sister organization of AIM UK. So that they're kind of the national, national groups that made up WIN as an organization. Um, I've also got experience working for a digital marketing agency called Music Ally, and uh, in a formal life, I was also a roadie lugging guitars around. So I've got quite a varied experience in the music industry so far. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you guys about releasing your music. And I watched uh, I watched some of the presentation with Bandcamp last week, and I watched a lot of your questions. I've kind of decided to tailor my presentation accordingly in terms of what I what I saw as pressure points maybe. Um, so first off, I'm just gonna talk to you guys uh, kind of about releasing music. Like where, where do you actually start? How do you pick a distributor? What are the key aspects that you should be looking at? Uh, and then after that, I will walk you through a bit of a timeline of things that I think you should be considering leading up to your release. So looking at a six, a six week timeline uh, from, yeah, ahead of your release. Um, and I've said, I've said to Adam that I love questions, the more the merrier, and feel free to ask them throughout the session because I'm going to be touching on quite a few, like I'm going to be touching on quite a few areas. So it, it probably makes sense to stop uh, where you have a question. So distribution. Um, there's so many different options for you guys to choose from. And it's often, it's very difficult to know where to start i know it can be a little bit overwhelming and there's a lot of companies that kind of seemingly do a lot of the same things so this is a list of key considerations that i've pulled out from a um a report that came out i think it was last year but i might be having a corona brain it might be 2019 uh called distribution revolution which was published by um aim uk and cmu and that is a 30 page document that I recommend if you're interested in the topic that you have a look through because uh, it goes into greater detail on all these different areas. But as kind of key considerations for you to look at, uh, I'm just going to walk you through each of them. Um, start starting with, you know, the, the, the one that most people well, uh, that this is the first question often fees, stru fee structures, percentages and advantages, uh, sorry, uh, and advances. Because you'll see there's a lot of companies that have a very different charging model for how they um, for how they operate. Some some companies will charge like a zero percent commission fee to themselves and they'll but they'll charge a 
um, submission fee. So a flat rate to get your music out there, either as a subscription on a yearly basis or uh, as a one-time flat fee, and they won't charge you anything. But then on the other end of the scale, you've got a you know, you've got companies that charge you up to say 40% of your digital sales. Um, but for that 40%, they'll do a whole lot more. So it's all about the services that, that they offer for the percentages that they take. We sit kind of somewhere, not in the middle, more towards the DIY end of the scale. We charge a 9% fee on the back end, but, but for that um, for that money, we make sure that we add in a lot of services to make sure that you as an independent artist can kind of operate on your own. Um, and I'll come back come back to some of these points. Payments is another big one. Some companies will uh, pay you on a quarterly basis or every six months, for instance. Um, but, you know, recognizing that this might be a bit of a challenge, especially for independent musicians in 2021, you, you want access to your cash more quickly. We, on the other hand, we operate in a way where we can pay on a weekly basis. You just set your your um, your threshold effectively. Like I want to get paid after fifty pounds, a hundred pounds, or and then then that will trigger um, platform and portal. Uh, this this is I think a very important one in the age of data because. You want to be able to have your streaming data presented to you in a very understandable and simple way so that you don't have to be a statistician to be able to, to, to understand what it says, you know. Uh, a lot of these different companies will be able to, you'll be able to see demo versions, for instance, on, say, on YouTube or on their website, looking at what the back-end system looks like. Um, so that that's definitely one to consider. Distributed DSP rela relationship and reach. Um, I think this is this is a key one. Maybe especially when you're talking about niche genres, making sure that your distributor has the relationships across these streaming platforms, so that they have somebody to talk to there and can promote your music to. But also on a technical level, it's very very important. Um, one of the really common er uh, mistakes that you see in the distribution world is um, people, uh, sorry, uh, distributors delivering music to the wrong profile because there's so many profiles with the exact same name. Um, this is something that we've we've built integrations with Spotify and Apple so that it can't really happen. Uh, and if you go to Spotify and Apple's website, you'll see a list on each of them and more the other ones as well. Um, but you'll see a list there where they that they have a preferred distribution partner list. Com companies are there for a reason. Um, that means that they adhere to, you know, data policies and, tra you know, transfers of, of content is done in a correct way. Um, and I don't think you can underestimate that because, you know, if, if you have set a release date for the 15th of February and your music isn't on there on the 15th of February and it isn't fixed by, say, the 20th of February, that's a big problem because you've missed out on that initial, um, the initial kind of release high, if you will, the, the interaction with your fans. Which brings me nicely on to the next point. Can you get a hold of somebody? Uh, I don't think, again, another thing I don't think you can underestimate is making sure that you have that you have a distributor where you've got the ability to actually talk to somebody um especially in the independent sector where sometimes you you know a lot of the times you people don't have a manager they don't have an agent you need you need to be able to ask your questions to somebody in the industry to give you a little bit of sensible feedback uh, and making sure that your distribution partner has that ability i think is very very important um, added services offered, this can be every, anything from digital marketing tools to mastering services, a, 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 anything, landing pages, short links on release day. Uh, all of this is normally rolled into your distribution fee or your distribution percentage, um, or the, uh, your distribution partner might offer it as a bun bundle on service, um, but worth looking at. Publishing as well. Um, 
so many people end up leaving their publishing income on the table because historically it's been very difficult to, to be able to get a publishing deal. Um, and the, the kind of barrier to entry on, on that front has massively been lowered over the last couple of years with companies like Centric and SongTrust, which function as a publishing administration tool. Um, SongTrust is one of our sister companies. So we've been able to bundle that into our distribution service as, as an option. Like if you want to, if you want to submit your music um, and you want Song Trust to be able to take care of your publishing admin and you want to keep everything in one place, then we can do that for you. Um, sync is obviously uh, important as well. Uh, have, having your distribution service being able to, to offer sync placements on a, an exclusive or non-exclusive basis can be extremely helpful as sync fees are often quite high. Um, and I think especially within the sort of genre that we're talking about here, sync is a massive opportunity across advertisement um, on TV, for instance. Um, clear release structure and flow, making sure that it's not a very, it's kind of goes hand in hand with the portal, but making sure that the release structure is an understandable process for you and that, you, um, that you're submitting the, the correct content. And if you're not, submitting the, the correct content that your platform will inform you uh, that your artwork is the wrong format, for instance, or the wrong file. Um, genre and regional expertise. This, this can be extremely useful if you're in genres, um, making sure that you have somebody at the company that understands your ecosystem, what that looks like across digital services, whether that's kind of the playlist ecosystem or who the important curators are, and they, or which countries are likely to consume your genre of music? Because obviously there's a there's a difference between regions, what what they tend to listen to. So making sure that you have a distribution partner that has that reach um, and maybe operates in multiple territories, not necessarily just the one. And then last point, important for for some, not so important for others, is the question around independence. Whether, whether you want to whether you want to work with a distribution service that is independently owned or whether you want to work with a distribution service that is major owned, so Universal, Sony, or Warner owned um, within a much bigger ecosystem. So that's kind of the key aspects, I think, of things to look at with distribution. Um, anybody have any questions before I move on to the sort of release flow? No, thanks. <laughs> right, so, so as I said, I was going to um, work work my way up to release day, starting six weeks out, a few things that I think are worth looking at and considering ahead of your release. This might seem like an obvious one. Um, deliver to all platforms and making, sh making sure that you have your metadata in order. And by metadata, I mean things like artwork, ISRC codes, UPC codes, and all, all these other things that make sure that you get paid. Because at the end of the day, that's what you want to what, what you want to achieve by delivering your music. So, as an example, we deliver to over 150 digital platforms in, worldwide, including TikTok and Instagram, and that that list keeps growing all the time as new services pop up, uh, regional services or very genre specific services. Uh, so making sure that you have, you know, a distribution partner that is up to date on which DSPs are kind of happening at the moment is important. And don't make assumptions about where your fans consume music. I think. In, in, in Western Europe, in the UK and Ireland, we, has, we have a tendency to overly focus on Spotify as a streaming platform. But there's a lot of other platforms that not only do well in the UK and Ireland, but also across Europe and, and in other markets. Um, making sure that you, that you keep on top of all these different services it is important so because you might be able to spot a new trend. There might be you know, there might be kind of an underground jazz scene in India that you weren't aware of, um, that you can tap into, for instance. Uh, but, but just make sure that your music goes across all the different platforms. Um, 
there's over 400 million people with a music subscription service and that was that was q1 2020 so that's probably grown quite significantly since then as streaming has kind of continued to grow throughout the pandemic period um but that you know that that's a good starting point and that's not talking about people that consume music on free services like free services ad, ad supported services like youtube um Streaming is kind of key in this day and age. Download as well, but more people skew towards streaming now than, than they did downloading. Um, and, you know, th there's a lot of competition in, th there's a lot of competition now for streaming. There's 45,000 tracks at least being released to streaming services every single day. So you kind of, you have to, you have to make sure that you do your very best to stand out and that you're using all these different tools that the services offer you to make sure that you can kind of cut through the noise. Um, I'm going to get this one out of the way quickly. This, this one is one that scares, scares people a little bit uh, because it's very new and people don't quite understand it. But TikTok is a fantastic platform for you to play around with. Um, and I, again, jazz music, I think it could do incredibly well on this platform. Uh, on the left hand side there, I've included um, a picture from the whole sea shanty craze that hit TikTok in the last couple of months, um, which obviously nobody expected that a bunch of 17 year olds would all of a sudden start listening to sea shanties. But that just goes to show that it's a it's, it's a platform where different where a lot of things can happen and new trends can start building very, very quickly. Um, and when you see that, that that graph in the bottom there, uh, it shows an artist who whose name I can't say, but it were very much a part of this sea shanty craze, an artist that we were working with. And as you can see, that the, the streaming numbers are relatively low for a really long time leading up to when that whole craze started happening. And then almost overnight, they started getting 800,000 streams a day. Um, for a hot little second there they also ended up um being i think second or number one on the spotify global viral charts and they topped them uh in a lot of the different national charts as well and and the point of that is kind of that yeah yes it's, it's a platform that um, in itself is not necessarily a streaming platform, but the popularity on a platform like that can, can bleed over into your streaming numbers. So I think don't be afraid of trying it and just experimenting with it. And when, when and if you decide to do that, you know, when you go through a distributor, for, like us, for instance, make sure that you talk to your distributor and get them to deliver the uh, clip time. That you want to that that you want to have featured on that platform, so it's it's a it's a, a very short clip that they allow on. So making sure that you kind of optimize that to to the best clip of your track is very important. Yeah, on the mailing list, they have a fantastic mailing list um, that includes so much information on how to use the service and how to promote yourself and how to work best on on the service but at the end of the day it's it's a community-based platform i think a lot of marketing companies haven't quite cracked how to how to market in, in a traditional way so it's still a little bit like like the wild west um get spotify for artists and get verified um so when you when you distribute your music through CD Baby, we have a fast track instant artist verification um, that gives you access to your Spotify for artists. This uh, is a result of us being one of their preferred partners, but gaining access to this backend system allows you to um, edit your profile, edit your profile images, and making sure that you add a bio that's representative of you. Um, and also there's a huge benefit to Spotify seeing that you're interacting with the tools that they offer you. They, they want to see that you're using them. And if they do, then they're more likely to kind of push you as an artist out, out to their fans. And then uh, there's a, um, there is a list there of different things that you can do. I'm sure most of you will have seen all, most of these features when, when you log in Spotify, if you have Spotify. Um, the artist pick feature, for instance, is really, I, I really like that. Um, 
because it allows for you to get a better understanding of who the artist is and what kind of scene they're a part of. And I think it's a brilliant opportunity if you're, especially if you're in a bit of a niche part of a niche genre or you in a smaller kind of subculture, then you can be using this to be promoting each other and drag people from, from profile to profile amongst your kind of group of friends or, or colleagues. Um, you can create your own playlists, which I also recommend that most that, that artists do. Um, and this can be anything you want. It, it doesn't have to follow some sort of formula, you know, but the, the sort of music that inspires you or the music that you like to listen to when you go to sleep, whatever it might be. Um, I think in, in, a, in, in a world where people feel really disconnected in many ways, doing these sort of things that helps create a little bit more of a, an understanding of you as an artist is very appealing to a fan. Um, because they, you know, th there's that special feeling you have with, with an artist that you really like, if you know stuff about them, that you, f you feel more connected with them in a way. Um, Spotify for Artists also provides really good streaming data on the back end so, you, so that you can see if there's been any developments, uh, you know, if you've been picked up by some playlists or whatever it might be, they present it to you in a really, really good way. So it's, it's worth checking out and, and, um, Getting, getting a little bit of a, an idea of who your fans are on that platform because you might realise that you your fans skew younger or older or maybe you have a huge fan base in Germany that you didn't realise that you had. Um, all, of these, all of this information can be extremely useful for you further down the line when making decisions. It, as an independent artist, you don't have tons of marketing budget available to you, you know? So if you can make better and educated decisions... That's really helpful. Um, and then last thing there, we've said submit tracks for playlist consideration three to four weeks out. Spotify asks for a minimum of a week out, and I'll come back to this a bit more on a different slide. Um, but three, if you do it three to four weeks out, you, you're a golden child. <laughs> um, same thing here, claiming Apple for Music. This is another huge platform. Uh, even if you're not necessarily a user of Apple or, or Spotify, whichever platform it might be, each of them allows you to gain access to some really interesting um, information and allows for you to tailor your profile. And the same thing applies here. If, if you go in and you make sure that you update your artist profile with images and things like that, Apple are much more likely to to, to, to provide you with support because you're using their tools. Um, the really interesting thing about Apple backend data is that it allows you access to Shazam stats. Um, Shazam being the audio recognition app that if you're you you know if, you, if you're watching a TV show and you hear a track and you think it sounds really cool, you Shazam it. Um, so Apple, uh, the Apple backend allows you to, to pull in that information. And obviously iTunes analytics as well. Um, same thing here. Amazon, Amazon is a very much a growing, um, uh, very much a growing uh, subscription service. Um, same thing with Deezer. Deezer is absolutely massive in Latin America and in France. Amazon is growing pretty quickly, both here and in the US. Uh, so making sure that you get access to them super key. Uh, and the really cool feature with the Amazon backend is that it gives you Alexa information so when when your wife is yelling at the alexa to to play something this feeds into the amazon for music backend so you can have a look um and and on the on the deezer deezer backstage as they call it being able to have a bio in multiple languages is super super cool because it's originally a french company uh and it's very like i said very popular in latin america for instance being able to, to have multiple languages for your uh, bio is fantastic. So four weeks out from your release, um, launch a show.co campaign. So show.co is one of our tools that we offer to our artists uh, as part of the 9% commission that we take. So as, as a CD Baby artist, you, realize, you get, get access to one of these accounts for free 
um, the majors use it and a lot, some of the kind of leading independent record labels use show.co as a service. And it allows for you to do a lot of, um, it allows for you to do a lot of digital marketing in quite a simple way, which is fantastic. You don't have to be a digital marketing expert to be able to use it as a tool. Uh, I'm by no means a digital marketing expert and I can, I, I can use it. Um, one of my favorite <clears throat> functionalities of it is something called a Spotify pre-save campaign, which is what you see an example of, of on the left-hand side there. So that's, uh, it, you generate like a landing page that looks like that, um, that you can use to promote on social media or in your email list or however you want to use it. Um, and you, you encourage your fans to go in and pre-save the track before it's launched, which means that not only will the track appear in their saved library on your release day, but, but they will also automatically follow your artist profile on Spotify, which is, that's kind of the crucial number that you really want to be pushing because the more, the more followers you have, the easier it is um, to hit people's algorithmic playlist, which I'll get back to it uh, a bit later. But other than that, you can be running um, email subscription growth campaigns. You can, do, you can run competitions. You can run social unlocks. Um, we also have an ad builder service then, so you can place banner ads and interactive ads on music sites and blogs uh, for cheaper than you, what you would do through Google ads. So, so that's quite exciting. And you can run audio ads, all, all kinds of stuff. Um, obviously, obviously, you have to be a CD Baby artist to, get, to be able to get access for free. Um, but you know, there's, there's other tools out there. If you're not a CD Baby artist, Sorry, if you're not a CD Baby artist, you can still go and use this tool. But 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 what you should be you should be playing around with these things, kind of leading up to your release, so that you get people excited at the point of release. So that's another example um, of a pre-save campaign. It looks really like it looks really neat and really simple, and you often see that the conversion rate's really high. On, on these because you're not necessarily asking for too much. You're just asking for people to, to save a track that comes out in three to four weeks, which is, you know, it's not a great exchange of data effectively. And also what these sort of campaigns can allow you to do is reward your fans. Um, so some of my favorite ones are ones where after the fan has got, gone in and pre-saved, they get redirected to an unlisted video on YouTube, for instance, where the artist is performing the track they're about to release acoustically. Um, so it kind of builds that tribalism almost in people. It, it, you know, it gives people the sense of being what one in a few that gets to, that gets to experience this. Um, so it's a nice carrot for you to use across social media to to encourage people to, to go in and follow you as an artist. Um, I'm realizing that I've rushed through a few slides now. Do anybody have any questions before I move on? Um, yeah, there are a couple of questions here in the chat. Um, first one is from Pat, uh, Pat R. Uh, do you want to ask it yourself, Pat, or will I do it for you? I'll do it for you. <laughs> He said uh, an obvious question, but just to clarify, uh, are Spotify, Apple um, Music, and all the major platforms included in distribution? Uh, and yeah. so automatically, do, are they all included through CD Baby's distribution? Yeah. So the, the kind of default Thanks, position, the, the kind of default position on on this is we, we will deliver everywhere unless you tell us specifically not to, um, and that's for that reason that you shouldn't shouldn't assume where your fans are and and, and you know so, some people might have a special deal in a country like they might be working with a label in Sweden for instance and need to exclude that as a territory um or they might not like a service we, we can do that but as a default position 150 plus platforms are included great mm -hmm. um and then Sean Heary had a question and um, is there a similar for artists platform for TikTok as there is for Spotify and Apple Music, et cetera, or is getting music on TikTok down to you creating an account and uploading a video with the music? 
So there's not a um, TikTok for artists as such just yet. I'm sh- I'm sure that will come very soon. Um, but so with TikTok, we we deliver music to TikTok. Um, so anybody that goes through us will be able to find their music on there. But that was what I mentioned that the clip times that TikTok allow for are really short because it, because that's the format of TikTok. It's short form videos, quick and simple. So making sure that you communicate with your distribution partner um, to say, this is the 30 seconds of, of my song that I think is the strongest and most relevant for that platform. Tell them that before you release uh, and they'll be able to go in and customize the clip time for you. Great. Uh, and then Kenneth, uh, our director, had a couple of questions in the chat. Do you want to take them, Kenneth? Sure. Um, just very quickly on the TikTok thing, um, and um, you know, it, uh, it's a it's primarily a visual medium, right? So, um, what about the visuals when it comes to the music? I mean, is there what tie-in is there? Um, what do you mean in terms of like music videos, or do you mean what kind of visuals would you? Yeah. So, I mean, if I'm an artist and I I have a, I have a record and and basically, you know, I going through CD Baby, you know, I have nothing to lose by putting a you know a thirty second clip out on TikTok. But I'm just wondering, is there what about the visual that comes up? I'm not very good with TikTok because I I refuse to go through yet another social media platform. But anyway, but but for as a professional as a professional interest, you know, mm-hmm. there's a lot of visual stuff. So do you team up with visual artists, or is it auto You know, or is it just a blank? Or what what does it look like? So if I I can create a video on TikTok right now and I can decide what which track I want to overlay it. So it, I can walk my dog and film it and I can put Emma McGann, my kind of crazy, mm-hmm. running running over it. Um, what I think is really important to understand about TikTok is it's much less of a... It's much less of a me to you. It's, it's, it's a continuous us thing it's an interactive platform much more so than than instagram i'll post a picture people will comment you might comment on you know you might respond to a few comments here and there but tiktok very much more relies on interaction between its users um which also kind of dictates a little bit the sort of content that perform well um on the platform but i don't think it it doesn't need to be anything too complicated or high production or anything like that it's Mm -hmm. mostly funny sort of stuff uh and i think it you know it's a platform that allows for you to play around see see if it works for you it might not you might not be a tiktoker that's okay Mm -hmm. um yeah yeah but just uh, i understand but to clarify i suppose if if the artist you know who wants to distribute with cd baby wants to engage with tiktok they would have to provide some sort of video to go with the 30 second audio that they're, they want to be featured. So, so anybody can use your music. That's kind of the thing. So um, if you as an artist going through CD Baby and you have your music delivered to TikTok, you as an artist can create a video where you say do a dance challenge to your own music and right. you overlay that music over your video of you doing a dance. But then you or Adam can also create a similar video using exactly the same music content. So that's how the music kind of spreads around as a platform because people replicate each other and they use the same content across multiple videos. So it just sits there effectively in like a library, if you will, where you can just search search up the the music that you want to use. You can can use your own music or you can use Cardi B's music. Up to you. So it's a it's an audio container for 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 cat videos. Yeah, gotcha. that's a good way of putting that. <laughs> yeah. And 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 my other question then, sorry, that was just an addendum to the TikTok uh, discussion. Um, can you, as a distributor, CD Baby, advise on you know you mentioned about you know these foreign markets, particularly particularly ones you know uh, less well known ones in Europe, but but ones in India, Asia, etc. As a distributor, can you advise um, on these boutique or foreign markets for specific genres or subgenres? You know, I mean, what type of what level of kind of curation goes into 
into the relationship with between CD Baby and the artist when it comes to you know maximizing the reach and the, and the target the targeted reach rather. Yeah. So. So obviously being a self-service platform, we have a lot of clients that we've uh, that we've never been in contact with, but we are increasingly focusing much more on um, kind of day-to-day -day relationships with our artists. And we, we talk to our, our local priority acts quite extensively. Um, so when it comes to reaching international markets, um, you know, if, if an artist comes to me and says, hey, I'm, I'm starting to see that I'm having a lot of traction in India or Brazil or wherever it might be, or you might be curious about learning more about these different markets. I think kind of the role of an independent distributor obviously is getting music from point A to point B, but it's also to be a little bit of a knowledge bank uh, for various different areas of, of the industry. Um, but we, you know, we as a company, we have offices in we have people in India, we have people in Brazil, Chile, Argentina, Singapore, South Africa, wherever it might be. So that's kind of the power of, of a distributor that has an international network, which you, you'll be able to see on distribution services websites where they have physical offices or where they have human beings. So if there's questions that arise about, uh, uh, you know, I know a bit about about the music scene or the, what happens in the music world in India. But I also have a colleague there that I can introduce you to, um, you know, and, and make those connections on your behalf. Great, thank yeah. you. All good? Right, yep. I'll, I'll move over to the next one. So this is, this, this area is still four weeks out ahead of your release. Um, and this is all about press, contacts, radio, and websites. Um, making sure that you're tracking people's email addresses. And I think I think a lot of people see email marketing as a, as becoming a little bit archaic. But I could not agree more. No, sorry, disagree more. Um, I think e emails is still very much a sort of thing that people interact with on a more um, what's the word I'm looking for here on a. Uh, they're much more aware when when you're scrolling through Instagram, you tend to just sit there and do that. Whereas when you're checking your email inbox, you look in a bit more detail at what you're doing. Um, so having having an artist that you follow email you and tell them what, what what's happening and that you've got stuff coming out is uh, I think is still very useful. And again, you see the conversion rates on emails actually being pretty high. Um, so making sure that you you capture email addresses of your fans and use it. You don't have to hammer people with an email every every three days, but when you've got stuff coming up, um, you know, live streams or releasing music, whatever it might be, drop people an email. Uh, but even if you just want to tell them what you've been doing during the pandemic, you know, I think people have a lot of time on their hands now. Uh, to interact with that sort of stuff. Um, making sure that you have an EPK or a one sheet is incredibly useful. Uh, and you can find loads of guides online on how to put together this. And it, do it doesn't have to be super, super complicated. It's effectively like a one page with a bio about who you are as an artist um, that has a picture that uh, EPK stands for electronic press kit, by the way. So, you know, having an electronic document that has hyperlinks, uh, like little widgets or something that leads to your Facebook, that leads to your Instagram. If you have Bandcamp, that leads to your Bandcamp. Uh, just like one centralized thing, short and sweet, that looks nifty, that you can send out to people uh, because it makes it a lot easier for people to to um, keep, keep a track, I guess. Um, but make sure that when you send out document uh, when you send out information to be it press contacts or radio or whoever it might be make sure that you don't add it as an attachment because a lot of uh, publications especially will not open emails that contain attachments in the fear that it contains some sort of virus so you can you can host these sorts of epks in your drop it like set up a dropbox for instance and you can just share the link to your dropbox um and that also saves people's inboxes um, there's a lot of amazing resources online for, for being able to, to find people in your space, like in your genre and in your subculture, like, like the unsigned guide. And I, I can't remember how much the, 
the subscription fee for the Unsung Guide is, but it's like a, the price of a cup of coffee a month or something. And they, they do a really good job at uh, having up-to-date directories of local radio stations and press outlets and things like that. So signing up to a service like that, you can, you can find a lot of contact information. Uh, and then you don't necessarily have to pay somebody else to do it. If you're a bit strapped for cash, you can reach out to these curators uh, directly. And I think another important thing to remember when you're reaching out to people, again, whether it's press, uh, press contacts, radio, whoever it might be, third party playlist curators, address people in a way that you, that you know who they are. So dear sir, madam, doesn't like that doesn't really, that doesn't really work. Um, you, it, I think when it comes, when it comes to this sort of reach out ahead of your release, uh, quality is much more important than quantity. So every, everybody likes to be recognized for the work that they do. And, and they like to work with artists that have an understanding of what they do, uh, as in the, the, per, the, the radio person or the press outlet or whatever it is. So, you know, sending an email saying, dear James, I listened to your radio show on Saturday. It was hilarious, blah, 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 is much more effective than just sending out a blast email to, to 300 people because it feels really faceless. Um, I get a lot of those emails and I, you know, we, we delete them <laughs> a lot of the time. Um, third party playlist curators is... Uh, a fantastic way to start building your presence across streaming platforms. Uh, and by this, I mean individuals or brands that, that curate their own playlists on Spotify, for instance. And you can, you can find them quite easily if you go into the search field on Spotify and you search for jazz or rock or whatever it might be. And then you scroll through playlists and you have a look and you see where you think your music fits in. Um, because sometimes it can be difficult to get onto editorial playlists, but this is a really good starting point. And often third party uh, curators are tastemakers within their scene. And, and actually the people that tend to listen to these playlists are much more engaged with them because they're there, because they're really, they're really into the music. Um, so the follower numbers might be a lot lower, but, but, but that's okay because, because the people that, listen to it actually listen to it um and then at the bottom there bbc introducing local radio you know don't don't underestimate the power of radio i think it's still very very relevant um and, and a good tip is often to reach out to the producers of these radio shows rather than the radio hosts themselves because the radio hosts get a lot of emails um and the produce producers uh, will be able to take your music to the relevant presenter if they think it fits. Two weeks out from your release, um, submit your new release for playlist consideration. Uh, we talked about Spotify for Artists before. They've built an amazing tool that allows for you as an artist to log in and for you to submit your own pitch to be considered by the editors across, um, across Spotify. And they have an incredible amount of playlists that fit every genre, every mood, every anything you can think of, whether you're driving or sleeping or partying, whatever, whatever it might be, they have they have playlists that fit within this. <clears throat> um, and it's this kind of democratizes the the playlist access in a way, in a in a really amazing way, because you yourself are able to go in there and talk about your music and convey, you know, convey the emotions. And I don't think, I don't think anybody can tell the artist's story as well as the artist can themselves. Um, so th this is a, this is a really useful tool. Um, but just make sure that you do it far enough ahead of time to, to hit that target of at least seven, seven days out. Um, another thing that this allows for you to do is, um, if if you if you submit your music through the playlist uh, the playlist pitching tool, then your music will automatically end up in the release radar and discover weekly playlists, which are the algorithmic playlists I mentioned before of Spotify, of people that follow you. So if you've been able to build up that follower number, the higher that follower number is, 
the more people's release radar playlist you're going to hit on release day automatically um, by, by submitting through this tool. And then the last point there is, can your distributor help? So some distributors pitch music to playlists and to editors and have really good relationships, and some um, some distribution services do not at all. We uh, we have a, a promo person based in London that uh, that pitches. I think the next slide, yeah. Here are some of the examples that of things that we've landed recently and some of the covers that we've landed recently for some of our UK and Irish based playlists. Uh, and actually, uh, the, uh, the Irish um, playlist, the, the country specific ones, are fantastic and they're really good at supporting t talent that might not necessarily have super high streaming numbers yet, but are incredibly talented. Um, so it's, yeah. The, 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 the availability is fantastic for you guys. Uh, we, we kind of touched on that previously in terms of third party playlist curators. Um, just going quickly into a bit more detail. You can, you can often find contact details for these pe people across social. So if you find a playlist on Spotify, for instance, where you think that your music might fit in, then just look up the brand name or look up the person and check like check them out on Twitter and Instagram and you can often find them there uh, and then you can just reach out to them directly and say that you think you'd fit um do, 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 do. Uh, podcasts uh, as I'm, I'm sure you're aware the, the kind of podcast interest growing across the DSPs and they're featuring much more music so podcast producers um, would love to hear from you as well um, I think, you know, it's an, it, as, as I'm sure you know, it's an industry of contacts, right? The more people that you reach out to and the more visible you make yourself, the easier it is for you to, to get that growth across digital services. One week before you release, um, you know, this is when you probably should be looking at setting up your digital advertising. Um, Instagram and Facebook are your probably your top two when it comes to creating digital ads. You can you can run campaigns for quite cheaply uh, across these services and have quite a large reach. Uh, and, they, but, and they are fantastic at providing tools and tips and tricks for how to optimize the cam campaigns that you run across social channels. And, you know, the, the, the beautiful thing about running ads there is that you can, you, you can go in and you can edit as you go on when you see what's working and what's not working and you can really kind of hone in on on what you're targeting uh and you can just have a play around for not a whole lot of money but um yeah you you use their use their so use their tools and their guides and stuff that they provide um video content kind of touch on that a little bit with TikTok, but more in term, but maybe more in terms of YouTube. Um, YouTube is hands down the biggest streaming platform in the world. It's huge. Uh, a lot of people use it as their primary streaming service, maybe especially outside um, Europe and, and the US. As you can see there, it's got 2 billion people that consume music on YouTube every single month. And that's up from 1 billion, not too long ago so maybe like a year and a half before that um and one quarter of all the content that's viewed on music is music videos um when you distribute music through us we uh we deliver uh we deliver to youtube on your behalf and and, and we can deliver to youtube on your behalf um <clears throat> making sure that it's available there being being such a, a key service but I think it's also definitely worthwhile making sure that you produce content that you can put up there, whether it's live videos or music videos, lyric videos, whatever it might be, uh, just to make sure that you're present on the platform and that you know that you're reaching as many people as possible. Uh, and it doesn't it doesn't have to be super expensive. I don't think in this day and age most people have. I don't think that, that many people have really expensive video equipment at home. And there's been a lot of amazing, absolutely fantastic uh, kind of lockdown uh, video content that has been released by musicians on YouTube over the last year. Um, so just be smart about it. 
And then on release day, smart links. Um, using a service like Linkfire or uh, or you get your distributor to provide you with with a smart link is um, super important because this creates a landing page uh, that you can see like here that ha that lists all the different services and allows for for your fans to click on the service that's relevant for them. So when you when you uh, put your music on on socials, when you push it on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, whatever it might be, then again, you're going back to this whole thing of not assuming where your fans are, as in which streaming service they're on. They might be on Apple, they might be on Spotify, they might be on Amazon. But if you're if you're servicing me a Spotify link and I don't have Spotify, and I'm like, like if I'm if I'm a mega fan, I'll go and find you on my chosen streaming service. But if I'm like an on the fence fan and you make it difficult for me then I'm less likely to, to go in and do that. So having a smart link that you can push out on release day is, is super key to make sure that the conversion rate is high. Um, and then, yeah, like communicating directly with fans across uh, online music forums. I think, you know, places like Reddit are fantastic places to find new fans and being able to push out your music because again it's that whole two-way communication rather than me presenting to you it's you and i talking together um and you see you see there that that section that or that point that says 1000 true fans um th there's a theory that that's all you need to be able to to sustain a living in the music industry as an artist if you have a thousand true fans that buy your merch when you sell merch, that buy gig ticket, that buys your vinyl, whatever it might be, then 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 you are a then you are a successful artist and you'll be able to live off your music. Um, and yeah, release day is definitely not the end of it. You this is kind of all the work that's that you should be doing leading up to your release, but this continues after you have released music as well um we have a lot of um uh, sorry we have we have a blog and a podcast for instance that we that we make publicly available on our website where you can find a lot of tips on how to create longevity for your release or, or even get tips on anything from kind of copy copyright questions that are how to best set up facebook ads um, but making sure that you keep pushing the release after so that you keep building for your next release is key because you don't want to see these like massive peaks and then drops and then you do nothing for two months and then you come back again. Um, you want to see kind of a steady upwards trajectory. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of amazing, amazing tools and services out there that can help you with this. Uh, and I recommend everybody check out Music Ally. If you are a record label independent record label or a manager or an artist i think you can get in contact with them and be able to get um a free subscription that's a sponsored subscription uh, and they're one of the market leaders in the uk and ireland for um specifically for digital marketing so i would recommend checking out them and yeah questions i'll stop sharing Hi. <laughs> hey everyone. So um handy thing is that you can use the reactions tab at the bottom of Zoom there to raise your hand. Um if you'd like to pop in and then I can queue you guys up yeah. as you come. Sorry, I know that was a lot of information just dumped at you guys all at once. <laughs> uh Ken Ken, Kenneth has his hand raised there. I only have my hand raised because I just wanted to say that was a great presentation. And um, I, I'm, I think some people might be a little bit shell shocked with the ton of like knowledge you just dropped there on some of the stuff. Um, for me personally, I mean, I, I, you know, maybe I'm showing my age now, but I, I, I rarely think of YouTube, you know, in, in, in an audio capacity. Um, but I know that it is probably one of the largest. I mean, 2 billion is unbelievable yeah. and, I, and i know and i know a lot of like uh younger generations who that is their primary 
platform of choice for for everything, be it video or audio and things like that. Um, and I suppose, I suppose, you know, like what I'm trying to grapple with is, you know, the the Spotify's and 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 YouTube. Uh, they all, you know, the, the payouts, you know, are, are are nothing in in comparison to what the music industry was. But that was that was then, and we need to deal with kind of the reality of now. And and do you find, I suppose, as a distributor, that you know, really spreading your bets across all of these services? has has uh like is of benefit you know in terms of uh prolonged you know um revenue generation no matter how small so i mean with that if you if you deliver your music across 150 platforms without a team you're not going to be able to keep a track of 150 platforms because you do nothing else uh i acknowledge that but um what's the worst thing that can happen by you making your music available you know you might discover some new fans or you might discover that there is a there's a there's a platform in particular where where people tend to listen to your kind of music more um the the, the per stream rates when you you know when people talk talk about them as like a, on a unit basis so, sounds shocking absolutely mm. i understand that um but it's a much less of a commitment for people to go in and stream one of your tracks than it was for them to go into a record shop and buy one of your records 20 years ago. Um, and now I can't remember the exact statistic on this, but um, Spotify came out relatively recently and kind of, um, and said, you know, the, the number of artists that are making a living on our platform is so much bigger than it used to be 10 years ago or, you know, like you haven't got that 1% of musicians anymore that make all the money. You've got 30,000 musicians that make a lot of money and are able to sustain themselves. But the num- you know, the numbers are a lot higher across these platforms as well. You know, you have some artists that stream in the billions and you have some that there's a big corner of Spotify where nobody's ever gone of music. Um, and you've got everything and anything in between. Um, but it should be a part of your strategy as a musician it mm. you know to to subsidize your live income and all these other uh, avenues to for you mm. to generate music um but but think of it as like i understand that people get a bit frustrated but but think of it as something exciting because you've never been able to access people in chile before or kenya without physically going to chile or kenya you can do that now and and you know especially if you're in a niche genre where there's not a high concentration of people per country that listen to your music you've all of a sudden now opened up a door where those people that are within that niche genre in that country in that country in that country can go to one place and they can consume your music and and it's made available which again can can trickle over into your social media and kind of your followers but when if you decide to do a live stream concert people can access from everywhere, you know? Um, so I think it's, it's, it's an amazing opportunity for artists in 2021. And I know that Pat and Cara both have their hands up, but I just have a quick thing I want to add as a question for you, which came up in previous discussions around digital distribution. And it is principally around the concept that artists think in terms of albums still, because as a creator, this is you know, this is what you want to do. You want to do a body of work, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, but the medium, the distribution medium isn't really album centric. You know, it's it's get a track on on a playlist in order, you know, so discoverability has changed. And I guess, you know, fundamentally, are do you find that people are still trying to apply analog models, you know, get a record, get a physical copy, put it in a record store, have people buy that? against you know this is a completely different the goalposts have kind of shifted a bit you know in terms of digital distribution like so so for some artists is it better to to you know the concept of long long playing long player like an album an lp um you know mightn't you know it might be a better strategy um as a musician to go for something that's a bunch of shorter releases you know i think it's i think it's very genre dependent and i think it depends on um 
on your fan base. I think if you if you have a fan base that tends to skew slightly older, they are much more attracted to um, a longer body of work um, and within certain genres, you know, like black metal, they don't release singles. They, they do albums, you know? Um, so I think it depends on which genre you're in. But but if you, if you kind of flip that on its head and think how long does it take you to create a, a full body of work? A year, two years, maybe. If how long does it take you to, to create a track in comparison? Um, this allows for you to drip feed stuff to your fans to keep them excited, to keep them engaged with you, like you haven't been able to do do in the same way before. Um, which helps you kind of build the, the, everything, like for every release that you do, you kind of chip away and you, you grow you grow that fan base much more so. Um, you don't, if you want to release albums, then by all means release albums. But the, the problem in a digital age is that in some ways you can make it a little bit more difficult for, for yourself because if that's all you've got to talk about, release-wise, music-wise for the next year, it's difficult to keep the conversation going with your fans. If you give them little bits and pieces along the way, it's easier to keep the conversation going, to keep them engaged. Um, so yeah. Thanks, Anne. <laughs> That's a very long-winded way of saying, do as you please. <laughs> well, I think, uh, so Pat there had a stand up first. Thanks, thanks, Adam. And uh, Thanks, everyone, for putting this uh, on, and thanks, Anne. It was a great presentation. Busy presentation. Yeah, um, yeah no, I know. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry. I, um, Pat Ryan is my name. I, um, I run, a, run a thing called Pat Ryan Music Services, and I help musicians set up on collection agencies like Imro, Rap, PPI, who don't want to do it themselves, or I advise them if they want help with it whatever. If they want me to do it, I charge a small fee and all that kind of stuff. So I was looking at, um, you know, Bandcamp last week and I worked on Bandcamp before and with CD Baby, I bought, I bought albums from CD Baby before it was what it is now. So I'm a little bit dated, but uh, <clears throat> nonetheless, I am, um, I was interested in CD Baby because quite a few people have asked me about digital distribution. Mm. And I'm, um, I'm, I, I was kind of a, a bit of a dinosaur about it in my attitude. Um, but I deliberately didn't go on to see how I joined. I have a, a song myself I can put up um, as well. And I was going to use that as a, as a guide for me to join CD Baby. Mm. I'm going to ask you the question, is it easy to join it? Because that wasn't in the presentation if you like is yeah. it easy for me once i have the isrc and the track and cover and all that kind of stuff we, we can we can even supply you with an isrc uh, as you don't have to do that on your I own have all that done i do that stuff Good yeah boy. <laughs> um yeah it's very easy it's a it's a system that's been developed over quite quite some time so it's designed that you know, a 17-year-old grime artist should be able to use it, but a 90-year-old gospel musician from Texas should be able to use it and anything and everything in between. Um, so, yeah, it's 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 designed to be easy. But but obviously, I'll, I'll drop my email in the uh, in the chat as well, so feel free to just reach out to me with any questions that you have or if there's anything that doesn't make sense. Um, okay. Okay. And I can, I can, you know, I can also provide, uh, yeah, Lot yeah, that's great information yeah yeah because i just i just want to start using it now because I, I have quite a few people asking me about putting stuff up and and the last thing you said to kenneth there about drip feeding tracks kind of made sense to me it well actually it made a lot of sense to me so i can talk to people that way as well thanks yeah. very much for your time no worries and, and and also you you can go to our website and you can just set up an account for free and you can have a look at what the submission process looks like if you don't like it just delete it you know okay Thanks. <laughs> Great. No worries. Um, and then, uh, Cara, I think your hand was up next. If you want to come in? Uh, yes, thank you so much. That was a fabulous presentation. Thank you. Um, I was curious, you mentioned um, reaching out to podcast producers. And this has been a thing that I've been wondering about lately because I'm hearing so much more music used in podcasts 
do you get a royalty generated if your music is being used in the podcast or is that kind of an exposure thing how how does that work do you know you, you know you normally get a buyout so you you, oh, okay. you can get a royalty rate uh per like in 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 the same sort of way that you would in a streaming world but you know uh podcasts podcasts are looking for for music to use and they'll offer often a fee much like a much like a sync like a sync deal okay yeah that's fabulous great thank you Doris? anyone else? Ooh, uh, um so we don't have any hands raised there yet does, does anyone else have any questions for him i've overwhelmed them <laughs> I mean, how many people here are, um, you know, have material on CD Baby or... Yeah, you that's know, what is... I wanted to ask, actually, Ken. I wanted to ask, like, if you already have material on CD Baby or, like, say, people like the IMC who might have back catalogs. Like, um, if you already have things up there, can you still contact people with about playlists and all that kind of thing? So play, playlists tend, editorial playlists tend to very much focus on new content <clears throat> uh, for the most part. That's kind of what the editors have been hired to do, to, to promote new music, uh, new releases, as you say. Um, so if you've never released, you know, if you're sitting on music that you recorded 10 years ago, but you never released, then that's a different story. But um um, but you can absolutely still contact your distributor to talk about how to get more out of it and if they have any advice for you. Um, definitely. And I think, you know, I think I think there's a lot of room in the third party uh, playlist world for, for, for maybe slightly older music. Um, but also it slightly depends on, on your genre. You know, you have a lot of you have a lot of mood based playlists on, on streaming services that are like before I go to bed sort of stuff they're not necessarily yeah. always as concerned with with brand new music as new music Friday is um so yeah I think there should always be room for conversation okay thank you thanks for the talk it was great <laughs> thanks that's that's interesting Hen because uh, um you know a lot of people are talking about you know um um theme as opposed to the specific content so like a playlist is a is a theme for a mood and things like that and and i think that i think we probably underestimate the power of that to grow onto um uh you know to to get onto bigger bigger playlists because really it's it is about getting onto those playlists to get into those orbits and into those radars you know for people so yeah, you know, th think about the way that as a music fan, you look for music. You don't necessarily always look for a specific genre or um, a specific artist. You, you go in there and you, you ask for something a bit more like, I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm, I'm tired, mm -hmm. I, I want to party. Um, and I think increasingly more with, without, with <laughs> without getting too deep into like voice activation Alexa stuff, um, the way that you as a, as a, as a human communicate with this machine is also very different than what you would type. Um, so yeah, I think, I think there's much more of a focus from streaming services to, to curate around moods. Well, I know that. And, I, I, sorry. And just when you submit music for distribution, making sure that you correctly apply those tags, what kind of mood it is very important. Uh, I was it. I think it was Neil Crowley. It was basically a piano player um, had a record, um, and he basically had a kind of a lullaby track and an instrumental track in that record. And somebody, somewhere, put it onto a playlist for uh, for parents putting their kids to to into slumber time. Um, and he, yeah, he logged in to his Spotify one day, and he was like, couldn't believe the this explosive growth and he didn't he was actually a little bit put out by it because he wasn't used to this you know but it just goes to show the kind of the power there and a lot of people went to his you know album so he converted a lot of people i guess is what i'm trying to say exactly. um through through that and he didn't even do it himself it was just something that was kind of you know who knows maybe yeah. a robot did it you know yeah. um i you know a lot a lot of the um, kind of priority artists that I work with it, it, here in Europe, they um, 
they produce instrumental music that sits really nicely on those kind of playlists and and the the benefit of them is is the longevity in it uh when a pop song goes on new music friday uk it stays there for a week and then might not see another playlist again uh, whereas uh, you know instrumental piano kind of meditation stuff it gets placed on a playlist and it might sit there for six months um so it's, it's very different how how they how the diff within different genres and stuff how they operate um does cd baby i'm sorry if i'm hugging her but i don't see any hands up so i'm just going to plow on all right um does cd baby have any data on kind of like the age demographic of certain services like you know what i mean are you are you monitoring how some of that might be going because like there might be growth in a particular service amongst a particular age group and that would indicate a general trend in younger audiences behavior you know like right now for a hot minute right it could be TikTok, and then do you know what i'm trying to say it's kind of like you know it's it, for, for a lot of self-releasing artists it's about where do you place your bets yeah. you know you mentioned yeah so any thoughts on that a lot, a lot of this information is publicly available online. Uh, the the services themselves tend to tend to release that information, or at least parts of that information. Um, I look at it because I'm intrigued by it. Um, and Amazon is a platform that, for instance, tends to skew a bit older. Apple also a little bit older than what the Spotify user base is. Um, Apple is definitely the key service in the UK when it comes to jazz music. Um, and they're great supporters of U UK jazz. Uh, Spotify also has a lot of playlists that um, for jazz music in, you know, happy jazz, sad jazz, whatever it might be. Um, but yeah, all, all, all these services cater to a slightly different demographic. And, uh, and you know, as you mentioned, Ken, TikTok, for instance, is is younger. Um, but, you know, familiarizing yourself with, with them, you, you can... And you can you can find a lot of this information online. Um, there's a really like if you really want to dig into it, if you're that kind of person, I am. There's a company called Media M I D I A that produce a lot of industry reports and a lot of industry data. Uh, they often do like quarterly roundups of how many people are on the different services and which genders they are and where they're located and. Yeah, media research. Oh, yeah. Great. God, the chat, the chat's flying here. We've got links aplenty in the in the chat room. Yeah. Um, I see a, a question from John. John, do you want to ask that or do you want Adam to read it out? Uh, sure, I can ask that. I was just wondering um, if tracks can be added through, or distributed through CD Baby kind of re retrospectively, because um, a few tracks that um, my vocal group has recorded, they were released, but they were done through somebody else. They were just put up on Spotify through this other person. Uh, and I think the subscription to that company or whatever, it lapsed and it's not actually available on Spotify anymore. So can those albums be redistributed through CD Baby or is it only for the new tracks that are coming, or new albums coming from now yeah. that will be distributed? Yeah, yeah, no, abs absolutely. A lot, a lot of what, um, you know, a lot of artists tend to move around different distributors and, and try different options. So that is also a huge part of our business, helping artists that have either had their content taken down or uh, or that just want to sw uh, swap distributors. I think I was trying to be quite balanced in my uh, key considerations for distribution. Um, personally, I'm not a massive fan of the subscription services because as you say, well, as you've identified, if you forget to pay your bill, all of a sudden your music is gone. And it, I, I, I'm not a fan. Um, disclaimer, not the opinion of CD Baby, etc. But, uh, but yeah, it's it's super, super simple. So like it, um, in your case, it, you know, you might not be able to salvage your previous streaming data. Uh, it depends how long it's been gone, etc. Um, but in in other cases, if you say have a track up through TuneCore or, or whatever other service you might be using, then um, we we can still we can still move that over super easily, and we can retain all the streaming data, as in the stream count, uh, so you don't lose all of that on the services, and we can retain your playlist placements and everything. Um, the, the important thing is just to make sure that you use your existing metadata. So making sure that you use the same ISRC code, same UPC code, um, same artwork, 
everything and it should map perfectly fine. We do it every single day. It's very easy. You treat it, you treat it as like it's a new release effectively. Okay, great. Thank you. And then you can, you can also set the, um, like the, the, uh, release date back. So like if, if this was a single from say 2016, that's now disappeared, you can, you can add, add it to streaming services again, and you can, you can say that it's a 2016 release. Perfect. Thanks a lot. All right. Before I forget, I'm also just going to drop my email into the chat. Um, so if anybody has any questions, or if anybody wants to like try us as a service, then at, you know, before you get going, shoot me an email and I'll see how I can help you. Um, much more so. Uh, there's a question from Denver. Does Denver want to talk? No. I, can, I, can, I can read it out there. Um, <laughs> so Denver asks, uh, how many tracks are included in the pro single release option on CD Baby? It seems an obvious question, but I saw on the help section that platform platforms have different limits of tracks for a single. So a single could be three songs, which I didn't know. Um, is the current price for a pro single per track or could there be more than one track included as a single? So um, what are you referring to there with the, with a single can be up to three. That's what the, um, that's how the streaming services themselves kind of classify it. So when you go taking Spotify as an example, if you go into Spotify and you look at the different sections, you have album section and you have singles and EP section uh, and they have, I think a, a single can be three tracks up to 20 minutes maybe, can't remember off the top of my head, but um, releasing music through us, singles and albums are defined differently. Single is an individual track, album is anything more. Um, if you drop me an email on that um, on that on that address, then you then I'll provide you with code so you don't have to pay anything for any upload whatsoever. Um, and it's it's just worth mentioning there that you, you were asking about a pro release. So we have two different options for distribution. One is a standard and one is a pro. The only difference between the two of them uh, is that with the pro release it releases at singles or albums you opt into publishing administration through song trust that I mentioned previously in the presentation. So that means that they will collect your publishing income from digital stores on your behalf. Um, and that's normally, we normally say like for every euro, every pound, that's roughly an additional 25p or 25 cents on top of that. Um, so it's definitely worth, it's money worth not leaving on the table. Um, but yeah, shoot me an email and I'll, uh, I'll give you all the codes that you need. Great, brilliant. Um, so are there any more questions out there before we finish things up? Yeah, sorry, if you're already signed up to a, a collection agency, mm -hmm. you obviously wouldn't sign up to the pro then. Like so, okay, so, that, so that's slightly different. Um, through like, okay, so if you make <clears throat> just just to simplify a little bit, if you make a pound of Spotify in streaming, publishing streaming revenue, that pound gets sent to PRS. PRS will pay roughly 50, like minus their commission fee, PRS will pay 50% roughly to you as the creator or the songwriter, but the other, and that's known as the writer's share or the composer's share. The other 50% of that is called a publisher's share. And if you don't have a publishing solution in place. You can't really access that money. So you need to have a publisher, a publishing administrator or, or a standard publishing deal to access that money. So what a song trust does is providing you that side of the publishing income. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, thanks a lot. No worries. Great. So um, I think that seems to be it. We'll probably finish up now. I uh, just want to say thank you so much, Han, for walking us through everything CD Baby has to offer. Um, it was incredibly helpful and insightful. And thanks as well to all the att attendees for tuning in and for asking some very pertinent questions. 
Uh, we're working on bringing you lots more professional development opportunities throughout the coming months. So make sure you're signed up for our musicians newsletter uh, so you can hear all about them first. There'll be a link in Zoom chat here and also in the description of the video below. Uh, so if you find this content useful, please like, subscribe and hit that notification bell uh, to connect with us. And yeah, uh, connect with us on all our, all our social media profiles. And thanks again to everyone for joining us and tuning in, and we'll see you at the next one.